let's not beat around the bush. We've all pirated something at one point in time, whether it was a movie, TV show, video game, ebook, it doesn't matter. These subscription services were supposed to give us most of what we wanted at a lower price. So, why is piracy back on the rise? Ever since 2018, BitTorrent traffic has skyrocketed after it fell off a cliff in 2012, which happened to coincide with the launch of Netflix streaming and Spotify. In this video, we will be going over the reasons why not only is piracy back on the rise, but why it will never die despite the media industry's best efforts. This is a retread of the same point that I made in my piracy always needs to be an option video, so I won't spend too much time here. Basically, when streaming services started to become more accessible, there were only three major players. Netflix, Amazon Prime Video, and Hulu. That was it. Between those three services, they had about 95% of the movies and shows that most people wanted to watch. As a result of this, movie and TV piracy fell off a cliff after 2012. But, surprise surprise, in 2018, piracy went back on the rise. That's the result of all of these other services popping up like CBS All Access, now known as Paramount Plus, YouTube Red, then renamed YouTube Premium, HBO had a streaming service at one point, they, they actually had three of them, HBO Go, HBO Now, and now they have HBO Max, which has now been renamed to just Max, and there was news back in 2018 that Disney was removing their content from Netflix to start up their own streaming service. All of these streaming services basically came along and arbitrarily divided up the market. Streaming is no longer the great deal that it was sold as a decade ago. What did all of these streaming services do to entice customers to subscribe though? Make exclusive shows. You would be very hard pressed to find anyone that isn't interested in at least one or two of the exclusives on each of these services. Amazon Prime has Jack Reacher and the Boys. Netflix has Stranger Things and Cobra Kai. Hulu has the reboot of Futurama and Handmaid's Tale. Disney Plus has all the Star Wars and Marvel shows. Paramount Plus has all the new Star Trek shows made after 2017 and the revival of iCarly. Apple TV Plus has Ted Lasso, so on and so forth. Now, do you think that the average person is going to sign up for all of these separate streaming services to watch one or two shows that they may be interested in? No. What is most likely happening is people are subscribing to the service that they're watching the most and pirating the rest of the movies and shows that they want to watch. Best case scenario, the average person signs up for one month of XYZ streaming service to watch all the exclusives that they want to watch and then cancel after that. But why give yourself that much headache just to watch one or two shows? Piracy in this case is actually the better service. You can watch all the shows you want to watch in one place. You know, that's how Netflix was sold to the general public. Before I made my video on why piracy always needs to be an option, the only movies and shows being delisted were on storefronts like the PlayStation Store, the Microsoft Store, whatever they call it now. I remember it was called Xbox Live Arcade, um, Voodoo, etc. for a variety of reasons. Then, David Zaslov decides to cancel Batgirl despite its near completion and remove a bunch of shows and movies from HBO Max, including Final Space, Infinity Train, and Raised by Wolves. Even Disney did it with Disney+. Plus. They removed shows like Big Shot with John Stamos, The World According to Jeff Goldblum, Earth to Ned, so on and so forth. Paramount even removed Star Trek Prodigy off of Paramount+. Plus. The logic was simple. No one was watching these shows. So they're costing us money to keep them on our streaming services. Apart from residual payments, you also, you also have server costs, archival costs, so on and so forth. A lot of other companies started to do this. The problem with this logic is it goes against everything that is taught to you in art school. What is taught to you in art school is the artwork is only yours until you release it out into the world. There will always be fans of whatever movie or TV show gets released out into the world whether you like it or not, companies. The common defense that a lot of corporate shows will spew is, well, just buy the movies or shows on physical media, bruh. The problem is in the streaming age, a lot of these movies and shows that are only being released on streaming are remaining on streaming. They are not coming to DVD or Blu-ray for the time being. That may change, 
but never bet on something that is not completely in your control. Only the first two seasons of Stranger Things were released to Blu-ray. Seasons 3 and 4 did not receive the same treatment, and I guarantee you Season 5 is not going to receive the same treatment as well. The Mandalorian has yet to be released to physical media officially. The world, according to Jeff Goldblum, was never released beyond Disney+, Plus, and that was a show I liked. So yes, I am a little pissed that The World According to Jeff Goldblum was delisted from Disney+, Plus, and a third season is basically not coming at this point. If I want to watch any of these delisted shows, I have one of three options. Option number one is to go out and buy the DVDs and Blu-rays. The problem with this option is, as I just stated, a lot of these shows didn't get official releases outside of the streaming services. Option number two is to wait and see if another streaming service will license the show like what Tubi did with Hemlock Grove. That was after uh, Netflix delisted that from its service. The problem with this option is that there is no guarantee that the show you like will ever get licensed to another company. Remember, don't bet on something that isn't completely in your control. Or the third option is I have to pirate these shows that got delisted. For many shows that got delisted on streaming services, option three is the path that is required if you want to watch any of these movies or shows again. The companies have already deemed the movie or show as not popular enough to justify the cost, and it isn't popular enough to release on physical media, so let's pose the question. What harm are you causing by downloading a show like The World According to Jeff Goldblum? There isn't any legitimate avenue as of right now to get your hands on that show if you want to watch it. Streaming services like Disney Plus were sold as an archive of the studio's film and TV history. Well... What we know now is a lot of movies and shows in these studios' catalogs are not on streaming, and they are removing movies and shows left and right. On top of delisting movies and TV shows, services like Netflix and Disney Plus are now introducing ad-supported tiers. I have two problems with this approach. The first problem is the double-dipping like what we saw with Cable. These streaming services not only want you to pay a subscription fee to access the service, but you're also going to watch ads on top of that. The reason why people don't have a problem with services like Crackle, like Crackle, Pluto TV, Tubi TV, or Freebie is that even though there are ads, there is no subscription fee attached to those streamers. As of the writing and recording of this video, I can open up Tubi TV and watch anything that is on that platform as long as I let the ads run. To most people, myself included, it's a pretty fair trade-off. Believe it or not, the double-dipping nature of ad-supported tiers isn't the biggest problem with them. The biggest problem with ad-supported tiers is that not all of the content is available on the ad-supported tier. Hey, Netflix subscriber, you want to save money? Sign up for our ad-supported tier. Oh, you want to watch Cobra Kai? Sorry, that show isn't available on the ad-supported tier. Oh, you want to watch House of Cards? Sorry, that show also isn't available on the ad-supported tier. So, what was the point of signing up for the ad-supported tier if the shows I want to watch aren't available to watch on the ad-supported tier? You know what service has all the movies and shows that I want to watch whenever I want for no subscription fee? Maybe there's ads, maybe there isn't. Every torrent site ever. I've said this for a long time. If streaming services wanted ad-supported tiers to take off on their services, then they should have made them free. Take the Tubi TV approach. Don't take a subscription fee, but in exchange, people watch the ads. With regards to ads, these companies also have to be very careful about how many ads get played over the course of one movie or an episode of a sitcom. If the ads are slightly annoying, then people will put up with them. If the ads become too, too intrusive and obnoxious, like what we see on YouTube currently, then people will find ways to avoid them. If the goal of ad-supported tiers was to reduce piracy by making access more affordable, then the streaming services sure as shit failed on that front. Sure, more users may have signed up for them, but if all the content isn't available on that tier, then what was the point of signing up for it? <laughs> This one is very simple. In my opinion, the cost to acquire the digital version of a video game or movie is simply too high in this day and age. If you want the newest game, depending on the console now, 
it'll run you anywhere from 60 to $70 USD. If you want to buy a movie digitally when it comes out, it might run you anywhere from 20 to $27 USD. God forbid if you want to rent a movie before you buy it. When that, when that is a new release, the rental will cost you around $6 USD for 48 hours. To put that into perspective, Blockbuster would only charge you $2.99 USD for the, same, for the same time frame of 48 hours. If the movie is a part of the Fandango at Home initiative on Vudu, you know, the, the, the theatrical to streaming, the rental will cost you $19.99 USD for 48 hours. Yes, the price of Blu-rays is around the same amount, on average of $25 USD when they first release. However, with the Blu-ray, you have the packaging cost, shipping cost, the retailer's overhead. So there's a lot going on in that price. It's the same with physical video games. But digital storefronts cut out all of those middlemen. You no longer need to put your movie or game onto a disc, put that disc into a box, and ship it out to various retailers. It's just a digital file that is going from point A to point B. That is it. This is why Napster was so popular in the late 90s. You have to remember that CDs were selling on average for about $18 to $20 USD when they initially came out then. Most people just wanted one or two songs from the album, and that's it. Think Britney Spears' Baby One More Time or Chumbawamba's Tub Thumping. However, if you wanted those songs, you had to go to Tower Records or Best Buy or Target or wherever you bought your CDs and drop at least $20 USD just for that one song. When Napster came along, people were saying, Hey, all I wanted was Baby One More Time or Tub Thumping, so why am I going to drop 20 bucks on a CD for one song when I can just download the one song from this peer-to-peer file sharing service? Yes, the music industry was livid, just ask Lars Ulrich, but a lot of people argued that Napster was popular because the price of music was too high for too long. So, why are the gaming and film industries immune from the same logic? Even comics went through this. Why is someone going to drop five bucks on something like Spider-Man One More Day when it may turn out to be a really shitty story? The transition from physical media to digital should have, bought, should have brought prices down. However, we see that that did not happen. Despite all the middlemen being cut out, the film industry still wants 25 bucks USD for a new movie and the gaming industry now wants $70 USD for a new game. But the prices of these digital goods isn't the only problem with digital media in its current form. DRM, or Digital Rights Management, is a system that, in theory, curbs piracy. But in practice, it actually encourages piracy. DRM is placed on everything from movies to video games to ebooks to digital comics, everything released digitally, essentially. Remember in 2022 when it was announced that the John Wick movies were being pulled from the PlayStation Store in some parts of the world? Well, even if you bought those movies and downloaded them to your PS4's hard drive, you wouldn't be able to watch them anymore. This is one form of DRM, a kill switch. Guess who didn't have to worry about not watching the John Wick movies on their PS4s? Uh, the people who bought them on DVD or Blu-ray, of course, and the people who pirated those movies and played them on their PS4 via a, via a thumb drive. See, the company can't destroy a pirate's copy of the John Wick movies because the pirated copy doesn't have that kill switch DRM in it. The pirates already cracked and or circumvented it before making it available as a torrent. Likewise with games, a lot of games had what was known as quote-unquote always online DRM. Meaning that even if you were playing a single player game, if your computer wasn't connected to the internet, sorry, you can't play the game anymore because we can't verify that your copy of the game is legitimate. Diablo 3 required its always online DRM to check the copy of the game every five minutes. The PC port of Assassin's Creed 2 had something very similar. When Watch Dogs launched in 2014, Uplay, which was Ubisoft's launcher on PC, was running into issues stemming from people wanting to play the game that they just bought on launch day. Very few legitimate consumers were able to get Watch Dogs to run on launch day because of this always online DRM. 
SimCity back in 2013. I don't remember. I don't remember if it was like 2015 or 20. It might have been 2013. Had the exact same issue with EA's launcher Origin. So I want to ask all of you listening. Can you guess who didn't have any problems playing Watch Dogs or SimCity on launch day, despite the issues with you playing Origin? The people who pirated the games. Once again, the DRM would have either been cracked entirely or circumvented to avoid the online check-in. When Denuvo came out and marketed itself as the uncrackable DRM, did the pirates just pack up their bags and go home? No, of course not. Anytime a company comes out and makes a claim that their DRM is uncrackable, piracy groups take that as a personal challenge. Then, when they crack the DRM, it's a major victory for the pirates, and it makes the DRM companies look like complete fools for challenging these people in the first place. Also, if you remember back in 2022, the uh, Denuvo DRM allowed one of the URLs to expire, so the always online DRM could not connect to the server to verify the legitimate copy. So if you bought uh, if you bought a game legitimately, I don't remember which games were affected, but you know, let's say you bought one of those games legitimately and you wanted to power it on and, and play it. Oh, sorry. The DR, the DRM cannot verify cannot verify the copy, but don't you dare go out and pirate it. All DRM does is it punishes the legitimate customer. If Ubisoft's VP of Digital Publishing, Chris Earley, didn't... Even even Ubisoft's VP of Digital Publishing, Chris Earley, did an interview with GameSpot back in 2014 where he said, quote, What becomes key for us is making sure we're delivering an experience to paying players that is quality. I don't want to put us in a position where we're punishing a paying player for what a pirate can get around. Anything is going to be able to be pirated given enough time and enough effort to get in there. So the question becomes, what do we create as services or as benefits and the quality of the game that will just have people want to pay for it? When confronted about the fact that Bethesda's Wolfenstein The New Order had been pirated 100,000 times in its first week of release, he said that it was a mistake to consider that entire figure as lost sales because some number of people were always going to steal the game. Yeah, no shit, Sherlock. Anyone with half a brain cell could have figured that one out. If these companies continue to punish their paying customers, then they're just going to say, you know what? Fuck you. I'm never buying anything legitimately ever again. Before I start this section, I do want to stress that I don't have a problem paying for movies or games or TV shows or books that I really want. However, what I have a problem with is being forced to buy the same movie, show, book, or game over and over and over and over and over again. When the home video standard switched from VHS to DVD, guess what? DVD players can't play VHS tapes. Unless if you get a combo VHS DVD player. Looks like you're going to have to repurchase all those movies that you bought on VHS by buying the DVDs. Blu-ray has now come out. Oh, Blu-ray players can play your DVDs, but don't you want your movies to look the best that they can? Why stick with the crummy DVDs when you can upgrade to 1080p full HD Blu-ray? Enter digital stores like Vudu. Oh, sorry. You can no longer use our disc to digital service for a nominal fee. I guess if you want to store your movies in the cloud legally, you're going to have to buy all those movies again through our digital storefront, where they will range anywhere between $10 to $25 USD. Oh, and did we tell you? You're only buying a license to watch that movie or show. If HBO decides to remove Game of Thrones from the iTunes store, which they did do, then sucks for you if you bought all the episodes through iTunes. Guess you're going to have to buy them again through Vudu or wherever HBO puts Game of Thrones on for purchase. Oh, you bought Resident Evil 4 when that came out for the PlayStation 2? Well, too bad. You can't put your disc into your PS4 and get the upgraded PS4 version. You're going to have to buy it again. Oh, you bought vanilla Resident Evil 4? Didn't you know? We're remaking Resident Evil 4 with all new graphics and a slightly different story. Oh, 
and you're going to have to pay anywhere from $60 to $70 USD if you want the quote-unquote better version of Resident Evil 4 instead of playing the old crappy one. Why should we let you upgrade when we can just extort you for more money? I think I've gone on long enough for all of you to get my point. Again, I don't mind paying for content that I want. What I have a problem with is a lot of these companies just expect you to buy the same movie on DVD, Blu-ray, 4K Blu-ray, 3D Blu-ray, or whatever the next format is going to be. But how dare you think about downloading a copy without DRM? How are those poor companies going to control what you can and can't watch? Oh, boo-hoo! Let me play a sad song for you on the world's smallest violin. are many more reasons why piracy will never die, but we would be here for another two hours if we have to go over those as well. But one other reason why it won't die is because, let's face it, there are people out there that don't want to pay money for anything. If we're all being really honest here, that's why piracy on the internet started. It wasn't some moral argument about how all information should be shared freely. I know that's what people say now. It was because people were tired of paying $20 USD for a CD just to listen to Chumbawamba's tub thumping. However, how something starts doesn't really matter over a long enough period of time. Yes, piracy started because people didn't want to pay for anything, but it has now led to this unintended consequence about preservation. If we look at video games, Square Enix openly admits that they lost the source code for Final Fantasy VIII, meaning that a re-release of that game is not going to be coming because Square Enix would have to rebuild that game from the ground up. The only way that you're pay the only way that the only way that you're playing Final Fantasy VIII now is through emulation. The world, according to Jeff Goldblum, was removed from Disney Plus with no DVD or Blu-ray release. If you want to watch the world, according to Jeff Goldblum then I guess you're going to have to pirate it or buy a bootleg DVD or Blu-ray from some guy at a convention. We can't trust the companies themselves to preserve their history. Back in 2013, the U.S. Library of Congress did a study and found that 75% of all, at least 75% of all silent films released from 1912 to 1929 by American studios are lost forever. According to the Film Foundation, which is being supported by people like Martin Scorsese, Francis Ford Coppola, George Lucas, at least 50% of all movies made prior to 1950 are just gone, lost forever. Some are probably sitting in vaults in Russia or Germany or Bulgaria, but that's maybe a small handful of that 75% if we're being generous. If we, if we want to use a very specific example, Nosferatu was only saved because of piracy. The widow of Bram Stoker, the original author of Dracula, sued the producers of Nosferatu for copyright infringement. The German courts agreed with the widow of Bram Stoker at the time and ordered all copies of that film to be destroyed. Think about it. If the German courts were successful in destroying every copy of Nosferatu, then one of the quintessential horror movies would have been lost forever. Only really talked about in books about how it ripped off Dracula and nothing more than that. So... Why will piracy never die? I think we have truly answered that question. Hey!